آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ The importance of free speech is like the importance of oxygen for staying alive. Without free speech, even though one may not be in prison, one feels that one is in prison. Just as oxygen is imperative for remaining alive, free speech is imperative for human dignity. Uh, free speech must not be restricted under any circumstances. The only uh, exception uh, to restricting free speech is as stipulated in the Convention for the Civil and Political Rights. In that convention, it stipulated that uh, there must be free speech in every country without any conditions. However, the only exception is there should be no free speech should not be used for propaganda, for war, or encouraging hate, or anything that could be hate, uh, encouraging and promoting hate in cases of gender, faith, or uh, tribe. Um, the only borderline for restricting human rights is uh, these principles that have been uh, stipulated in the Convention and in any human rights convention. من میتونم از یکی از موکلینم I can mention the case of one of my clients. He was a young blogger. And one day this young man wrote a letter to the Supreme Leader, Mr. Khamenei. And in his letter he said, Mr. Khamenei, I have just finished university. I would like to get married and start a life. But I have no jobs. I cannot even obtain a loan to start a job. You are constantly helping young Arabs, including Palestinians and Lebanese. Now imagine I am an Arab, I'm not an Iranian. Could you please help me? For that letter, this young man was in prison. A week later, his body was given to his family. This was a very painful incident for me. Internet has, in effect, come to the rescue of human rights, in a way. Uh, it restricts uh, governments uh, in uh, harassing people. Now, I'll give you an example. In about 1988, in Iran, within a week, the government executed 3,000 political prisoners, one of whom was my brother-in-law. But because internet was not available at the time, not many people heard about this. However, when Neda, years later, Neda Allah Sultan uh, was killed, thanks to internet, everyone around the world found out about it. It spread throughout the world, and as a result, other governments and the whole world reproached Iran about it. 
So, in my opinion, internet could lessen cases of violations of human rights. The problem with the internet in Iran is that the speed is very, very slow and it's also very expensive. According to an international report, Iran ranks amongst the main enemies of internet. Nevertheless, our young people have found ways and means of circumventing these filters. They have found all kinds of filter breakers. So this is very important and it's an important achievement by them in Iran. However, it's natural that in rural areas or in small cities, there is less access to internet. And uh, in bigger cities and the capital, Tehran, obviously people have more access, greater access to internet. As a result, awareness in rural areas about human rights is far less than awareness in big cities and the capital. The Iranian diaspora, they enjoy freedom of speech. They do not face the same restrictions as Iranians who live in the country do. So they must make utmost use of this freedom of speech. They should be the loudspeaker and a platform for the voice of the Iranian people, and their role should be to spread information about what is going on in the country to the outside world. Political freedom in Iran is very, very little. And I'll give you an example of it. Look at the elections in Iran. In any elections in Iran, be it parliamentary elections, presidential elections, municipality elections, there is a council known as the Guardian Council. And the role of the Guardian Council is to vet these candidates. Members of these Guardian Council, I have to mention, are not elected by the people. They're appointed by the Supreme Leader. And anyone who criticizes the regime or has criticized the regime, even a little, is immediately rejected by the Guardian Council and they cannot stand in any elections. So, in fact, not only these critics are facing trial or imprisonment, they can never, ever take part in anything political. Um, because anyone who wants to have a chance to stand in any elections knows that being entangled in any political matters would mean rejection by the Guardian Council. In the February elections, the reformists, they managed to send a few of their candidates to Parliament. Uh, however, that is no victory. And I tell you why. Because previously, years ago, when we had a reformist president, President Mohammed Khatami, the Parliament was held by majority reformists. And in the four years of the reformist control of Parliament, uh, when the executive and the legislative branches of powers were both in the hands of the reformists, they didn't achieve anything. They didn't manage to materialize any of their plans. And the reason for that is the political structure that exists in Iran. Based on the Iranian constitution, the supreme leader has absolute power. He has the power to veto any legislation. He can make any decision. He can decide to imprison somebody. He can decide to pardon someone. So in such a system, 
Speaking of reforms and victory of reformists is totally wrong. First, it's the constitution that has to be amended before any mention can be made of reforms or victory of reformists. I must say that eventually reform will happen in Iran and reformists will be victorious. The reason is that the majority of Iranian people are against the current system that exists in the country. However, the people are resisting violence because they do not want what happened in Syria to happen in Iran. They know that once they take to the streets, the government will relentlessly kill them as they did in 2009. Therefore, the silence of the Iranian people does not mean that they are there is no discontent among the people. And no government can sustain power when the majority of its people are against that government. And therefore, our people continue the resistance, albeit in a peaceful manner. And I'm sure that gradually and inevitably, they will be victorious and democracy will be established in Iran. Islam, like any other religion, has many interpretations. For instance, a church in the West may be against the marriage of homosexuals, whereas another church may approve such a marriage. Or a church may be against abortion, and another church may be pro-abortion. So the same applies to Islam. And a modern and progressive interpretation of Islam is in keeping with the needs and exigencies of today's society. And Islam, like all the other religions, also accepts different faiths. And uh, to prove that, I will recite to you a surah from the Holy Quran, which says, Prophet Muhammad, um, allow the infidels to follow their faith and you follow your own faith. You worship your own God and let them worship their own God. So how can we say that Islam does not approve of other religions when there is such a surah in the Holy Quran? Therefore, I proudly accepted to defend members of the Baha'i faith in Iran. And this angered the Iranian government to such an extent that security forces threatened me to resign. I refused to do so. And in order to stop them from harassing me, which they were doing continuously, I approached one of the religious leaders and sources of emulation in Iran, who was called Ayatollah Muntaziri. And I asked him, I said, can a Shiite defend members of the Baha'i faith? And his response to me was, of course, you should do so, even if you're not sure that they're innocent. It's your duty to do so. So having obtained this fatwa from the late Grand Ayatollah, I managed to silence the authorities. However, sadly, Ayatollah Muntaziri became a dissident and against the government. Therefore, uh, his word and his fatwa did not produce any changes and developments in the country. Uh, from a personal perspective, I am a Muslim. In fact, I'm a practicing Muslim. However, politically, 
I am secular. I believe in separation of religion from power. And the reason is that state should not be allowed to abuse the religious sentiments of the population. Whenever religion enters power, that is the beginning of disputes. And I think the best scenario is that there should be, anyone should be free to practice their own chosen religion and they all should have equal rights irrespective of their religions. But religion must be something very private. One should practice religion in the privacy of one's home. It should not be the state that uh, that should be religious. Religious must remain private and personal. And I cannot say that religion will bring unity. And the reason for that is that, as mentioned, there are various interpretations of religion and that could cause disputes. Look at how the situation was in Europe during the Middle Ages. Or look at the situation in the Middle East at present. That all these disputes are caused because of the different interpretations of religion. Religion deserves respect, but religion must be only for personal reasons. It must be practiced at home and it should not be in the hands of the government and it should not govern any society. It's democracy that should govern society and by that I mean a secular democracy.